Welcome to Fraud Eat Strategy, an FDI consulting podcast series in which we explore the myriad ways that fraud, corruption, and misconduct can derail strategy and cause havoc. I'm Scott Moritz, a Senior Managing Director in FTI's Forensic and Litigation Consulting segment, where I assist clients and their outside counsel in, in managing their response to event-driven, white-collar crime, misconduct, and bribery incidents. Thank you for listening. In this episode, we're going to explore the increased discovery of financial crime that occurs in a down cycle of the economy and how organizations can use fraud risk assessments in tandem with cost-cutting efforts to identify fraud, pursue avenues of recovery, and harden their organization against the potential negative consequences of fraud. To talk with us about that, I'm joined by Neil Borofsky, a partner at Jenner & Block, Uh, Neil is the former Special Inspector General of the Troubled Asset Relief Program and head of Jenner and Block's COVID-19 response team, where he counsels clients on how to navigate the crisis and the government's response to the global pandemic. Welcome, Neil. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, thanks for joining me. So, Neil, when you were the TARP IG, we were in the midst of a major economic downturn. How is the discovery of fraud different during a downturn than it is when times are good? In a lot of ways, it's a lot easier, uh, and particularly when you're sitting in a government position like an inspector general, because, you know, in an economic downturn, companies that have been committing fraud uh, or have fraudulent practices going on inside within, within them tend to be exposed. You know, Warren Buffett said very famously at, during the midst of the last crisis that when the tide goes out, you get to see who's wearing a bathing suit and who's not wearing a bathing suit. And, you know, there's a lot of truth in that. And so, especially when the economy was like then and what we're seeing right now, where you've had a long economic expansion with low interest rates, companies that are committing fraud, particularly accounting fraud, uh, where they're, they're cooking their books or moving numbers around, are able to really get away with it in a low interest rate environment. They're able to, to move the shells and keep it from being disclosed and sort of keep the whole scheme going. But once credit starts pulling back in a crisis, once you end up in a recessionary uh, environment, it becomes harder and harder to raise money in a capital market uh, or obtain the the loan or what type of credit that you want to get. And that's when you start seeing the failures, which start giving evidence of fraud. In the midst of that, if you put in, you know, the mother of all whales to use use some some fraud parlance, and and by that, I mean the, the unsuspecting source of money that for potential fraud, the United States government. And they push out hundreds of billions of dollars, usually in a hurry, um, usually without the type of normal controls you would expect and, and anti-fraud provisions. And so it sort of, that honey draws the criminal flies more than anything. And so when you're sitting as a special inspector general, you are sitting atop this, this beehive, if you will, this, if I could torture this analogy a little bit more, uh, and, and the flies are coming. And you, you're able to sort of see their, their books and records as they apply for certain types of relief. You can, you can look for red flags. And of course, once there's indication that they're failing, you know, the crime is not just the normal fraud on the market or investors, it's actually in the United States government itself. And so it really does um, expose a lot of ongoing frauds. And look, as companies become more desperate, as the economy gets worse and worse, they're more likely to turn to fraud to try to you know, smooth over a down quarter, uh, two down quarters as, as long as the crisis goes on with the hope that they'll be able to dig themselves out of it uh, once the economy turns around. Yeah, th- those are great points you make. You know, there's that fraud triangle and one leg of the, of the triangle mm-hmm. is pressure. Uh, plenty of that going on <laughs> right now that, you know, kind of then gives rise to the, the rationalizations and you're off to the races. Much of fraud and corruption is discovered by accident. So whether it's a whistleblower or some other confidential reporting channel, internal audit, maybe uncovering some red flags, uh, the receipt of a grand jury subpoena, or something other than the organization's own vigilance uh, is the most frequent catalyst for an investigation. What should companies be doing right now to find historical or ongoing frauds? And what should they do about it if they find it? So it obviously depends on the size and scale of the company, right? And, the, and their access to resources and what they have in their, their compliance department. Um, but, you know, one of the things we used in the government and what we see some of our larger clients doing is harnessing big data, right? There's so much data that is generated uh, by companies on the, 
on the business side of what they're doing. And a lot of times that data can be repurposed for compliance monitoring. And using data, you can sort of find anomalies or areas where there's potential fraud that the compliance group, legal group, who work with outside experts like FTI uh, or law firms like Jenner and Block, you know, to do that type of analysis of already existing data to see areas where there might be ongoing fraud uh, that's taking place. So I think that's, that's one thing. But the second, even more important and less expensive, is just to double down on your existing controls and procedures. There's just this real tendency during any time of economic dislocation to cut costs. And usually one of the first things that goes, unfortunately, is in the compliance function. But this is, my grandmother used to say, you know, cheap now, expensive later. And there's no better example of that when during an economic downturn where the incentive, again, it depends on the nature of the business, but if the company, if you have individuals, if it's a bank, you know, or anything involving sales, um, you know, these salespeople are going to be under a lot of pressure to generate business during an economic downturn. And this is where you have to be your most vigilant. And whatever your types of controls are, uh, whatever types of monitoring you're having as a company, it's not the time to pull those back, but it's to make sure that they're intact and being, being paid attention to, uh, because this is, this is the time where you have really the largest potential for a problem, not as opposed to the good times when it's sort of easy to bring in business and sell your widgets or make your loans or whatever your company's business is. Sage advice from Grandma Borofsky. <laughs> no, it's, it's really true. And I think it's got to be really difficult for companies to resist the temptation to cut. You know, there's always that second class citizen, you know, overhead stigma over folks that are not on the revenue side of a business, but it's, it's so vital, the absolute worst time to be cutting out those functions. Right. And you just look at the last crisis and the hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars of fines that, that hit the largest financial institutions uh, arising out of that, of the conduct of, and, and a lot of those fines, again, wasn't necessarily just the conduct going into the crisis, but what was happening in the years immediately following it. And so, you know, you have history as a very, very recent example right, of, of what happens when you cut back and drop your vigilance as opposed to increasing your vigilance uh, during a time of, 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 of crisis. No, that's a really good point. So some might argue that proactively looking for fraud is a, is a luxury that they can't afford right now since they need to be laser focused on the here and now. You know, how would you counter that argument? And is there you know, potential economic benefit to rooting out fraud and pursuing recoveries as opposed to waiting for them to come to you? Well, if fraud is happening inside of your company, right, it's, you know, the, the potential damage there is well, well beyond, you know, what you might lose because of the fraudulent activity if the company itself is the victim of the fraud. And even far, far beyond just the potential fine, which could be extraordinarily significant from the government if that fraud is detected by them and not by you and not, and not remediated, it goes to the culture of the institution itself. And again, it's not necessarily that you need to you know, bring in a, a mini FBI of former law enforcement to, to, you know, to, to look at every aspect of your company. But it does mean that monitoring and using your existing compliance function or, or beefing it up so that you can detect areas where there is a misconduct because that goes to certain to deeper cultural issues. And if your company is one that has pockets of fraud, uh, that calls into question the efficiency of what you're doing. It, call, it calls into question the, how effective your middle management is, what your culture is. And you know, those things are going to you know, accrue much more to the bottom line. Inefficient company with a bad culture is going to find itself getting into trouble. It's going to find having massive slippage. Money's being going to be lost to, to fraud and bad actors. Your employees are, are motivated not by what's best for the company, but what's best for their individual uh, compensation. And that's just bad for business. It's always important to be monitoring for this stuff, but particularly during downturns where there's this added incentive for misconduct, because it's, again, it's going to save you money so much more. It is such a multiplier on the money that is spent clients uh, to root out fraud, find misconduct, and correct misconduct um, than whatever perceived loss it is as far as an expense. And I think that's just been proven over and over again. No, I, I, I couldn't agree more. So even if somebody 
takes that proactive step and tries to be introspective and proactively look for fraud, but it doesn't lead directly to financial re- recoveries. What's the secondary benefit that, you know, the knowledge gained, you know, leading to stronger controls or a more resilient organization and increased likelihood of successful execution of the organization's strategy? You know, the you know, inverse of that, of course, is just like if you fail to consider fraud in your strategy, you know, does that, you know, potentially undermine it? I think there's two areas. First of all, if it turns out that you did this effort, it was a reasonable effort, a good effort, but it failed to detect misconduct and the government later learns of that misconduct, it's going to be a huge difference when you're, when you're talking to the government and trying to cooperate, if you can go and show what you were doing, that you were being vigilant, that you were doing everything that you could do, but look, even the best system in the world, best compliance system in the world, you know, there's still potential for misconduct that doesn't get detected by the company. But man, are you in a much, much better negotiating position you know, to avoid a, a guilty plea, to get a non-pros, uh, to get the government to walk away if you can demonstrate that even, in, even when times were tough, you were maintaining a level of vigilance uh, and surveillance and monitoring. So I think that's one. Two, you're going to find you know, or increase your potential to find misconduct that falls short of fraud, but it's still violations of the company's policies and procedures. And you want to be on the outlook for those types of bad apples. Now, sometimes you're going to need to get rid of those apples, right? Because they're willfully violating company policy. But other times it might be a a problem of a lack of training. Uh, It could be a, a cultural issue within, you know, a particular pod of the company. And those, those are the seeds that plant you know, future significant frauds. And so you're able to cure them, find them and fix them before they blossom into something that really is dangerous. That's really important. And third, if you have people in your company and you're not doing the right type of monitoring that are not on board with the company's culture, its philosophy, how it wants to carry out its business, you're going to have problems, right? You're going to have the types of scandals that we see if for no other reason, they're going off, they're following their own, their own culture, their own way of developing business that might be inconsistent with the company's values uh, and the company's direction. And again, you don't need to pay the king's ransom, right, to have a good effective control system and monitoring system, a training system, a compliance feature. Like this stuff doesn't necessarily need to cost a fortune, but the absence of it can be extraordinarily expensive uh, and directly impact the, the bottom line. And, you know, I think one of the examples I I talk about is that, you know, when we were the monitor of Credit Suisse, which I was appointed by by the New York State Department of Financial Services, by the end of that monitorship, and this is all in the public record, you know, the company had the highest level of profit and revenue in the business that we were monitoring than in the company's multi-hundred year history. And they were doing things in a compliant way uh, with the right culture, and they were making more money. Now, that's not necessarily solely because of the monitorship, but it shows that when you have these cultural shifts at institutions, when you prioritize compliance, it does go to the bottom line in, in efficiency and the whole company moving in one direction. No, that's a really good point. And I, you know, it, it, it's one that bears repeating. I, I think, uh, you know, when Siemens had that watershed FCPA case, you know, that you know, kind of global uh, conduct, you know, spanning 80 countries and, you know, over a billion and, bribes and then fines. The coming out of that, they were a more profitable enterprise than they were as a result of the of the bribery behavior, even though they expended huge sums of money remediating it, even so they, they ended up getting you know a significant return on that compliance investment. And it's not surprising when you really take a step and think about it. If you're at a company where crime is being committed openly and that is the culture of the institution, why on earth would you think that your employees are looking out for what's best for the company. They're going to follow that culture and do what's best for themselves uh, as they perceive it within that culture. And that's never going to be better for the bottom line than an institution where people are proud to work there and their incentives are aligned with the interests of the company um, to follow the company's policies, which, you know, well-designed policies, again, they're not just there to keep people out of trouble, they're there to uh, maximize the profitability and efficiency of the company. Oh, it's so true. That source of pride is such an important underpinning of a ethical culture that I, I think some people take for granted. The relief program has been in place for months now. 
and and I think we're seeing you know sort of two things. We're seeing some old tried and true frauds with a COVID nineteen uh, paint job, and then we're also seeing you know maybe some new things that are pandemic specific. What are some of the old frauds that? we're continuing to see in the midst of this economic cycle? And is there anything new or unexpected on the horizon? Yeah, I mean, look, I think we're seeing all the things that you would expect to see. Um, you know, with respect to the government programs themselves, the biggest one that's been launched so far, the, the PPP, the program that the SBA and Treasury have launched to, to get money into the hands of smaller businesses. Look, we said it the, the day it was launched, the day before it was launched, this is going to be a program that's going to be absolutely riddled with fraud. It's going to be a playground for fraud. And we said the reason why we were able to say that with so much confidence is that the program was rushed out with almost no anti-fraud protections even thought about. And it was for a goal to get as much money out to as many businesses as quickly as possible. And everything that in that program's design was with that in mind. And if you do that, then you don't have room for the control fraud controls, which slow things down and limit the number of people it can get. And you know, we can agree or disagree whether that was a good policy choice. It probably was on balance a good policy choice given the immediacy of the danger. But boy, was is this one open for fraud. And we're already seeing, which is relatively quickly in the white collar world, right? To start seeing True. prosecutions stack up so quickly. Usually it takes a while for these cases to go. But the fraud so far have been so over the top, so obvious. Um, companies getting money that aren't companies, right? They're saying, hey, uh, we got these three restaurants and so I wanted this money. And it turns out that they have no restaurants. Um, com- people taking money saying, hey, I'm going to use this money for payroll and buying a Rolex or a Bentley or just putting you know, huge amounts of, of cash. You know, and these are just sort of the first wave. You're going to see they're more sophisticated frauds with time, assuming that the Department of Justice commits the necessary resources. You're going to see shell companies that don't exist, that have no business, that are, that are making these representations. You're going to see insider cases. So these are going to be individuals at banks that are originating these loans who are working with others to commit, create fraudulent applications. You're going to see wholesale lying about the number of employees because these are all forgivable loans. And you have to make sort of certifications about your payroll levels in order to get the money forgiven. So you can see enormous amount of, of just flat out lying there. And so you're going to see that in that program. And that's going to be kicking around for a while. And, and the real test, I think, for the government is that it doesn't get lost in all this low hanging fruit. These very easy, smaller cases that are going to be part of this program and, and not set aside the necessary resources for some of the bigger cases in which the government is going to be a victim. And that's going to be in some of the bigger, bigger programs that are still just underway of getting launched. You know, the Federal Reserve has committed trillions and trillions of dollars to lending programs to businesses of all shapes or sizes. You know, and any company that's committing, already committing a fraud uh, or has, you know, misrepresentations of, of, of its numbers um, and then goes into one of these programs is repeating that, that misconduct but now the government is the victim in addition to the market or, or investors. And so that's one I think is going to be very interesting to keep an eye on. So in other words, if a company is raising money through the capital markets and is issuing a bond prospectus that has misrepresentations in it, now the Fed is buying those bonds, right? And so now it's not just investors, but the, the Federal Reserve backstopped by the Treasury. Now, if a, a company lies on its loan application and, that, and the Federal Reserve buys that loan through the Main Street program, again, now the Federal Reserve is the victim. And so you're going to see those types of frauds. That's going to be the next wave. And you're going to have a very highly motivated group of former, you know, as a former FBI agent, you know that the FBI is going to be all over these cases when it's the government that is the victim, not just Citibank or JP Morgan Chase or, or whatever the bank may be. And you're going to have dedicated resources. So I think that's going to be an area where you're going to see, um, you know, a, a lot of activity a lot of investigation and a lot of oversight because in addition to the law, normal law enforcement uh, agencies, you have a new special inspector general, you have a congressional oversight commission and you have Congress and you know, the politics of this are, are going to be in play as well. So I think that's the area that although the crimes are not new um, I think that, you know, those types of cases and the attention that they're going to get is, is going to be pretty much unprecedented given the size and scope of these programs.
No, I, I agree. I think the uh, we're just scratching the surface now that the really egregious, you know, and uh, unsophisticated frauds that are uh, easily charged. I think you're right. I think some of these that are going to be more involved and insider involvement, the you know, where it's a conspiracy between the lender and borrowers, which, you know, typically, you know, if you look at the, you know, certified fraud examiners report to the nations, those types of frauds are the ones that tend to run the longest. And those are the ones that, that tend to go the longest undetected. Uh, and also have the biggest, you know, negative financial consequences. So yeah, you're right. I think those are going to come out, you know, further out on the timeline. So speaking of which, you know, I, I think prior to the CARES Act, there were very few people outside of our industries that were aware of the fact that SIGTARP is still up and running. It's probably hard for people to wrap their head around the fact that 12 years later, you know, there are still you know, investigating fraud against that program, pursuing recoveries in the, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. What, what does that bode for the Special Inspector General for Pandemic Relief and the, you know, the Pandemic Response Accountability Committee? Uh, will they still be going strong 12, 15 years from now? Or is there something different this time? Well, the legislation that created this, the new Special Inspector General was almost identical identical lift out of the law that created my office of SIGTARP, but it had three significant changes. One, a different name, right? Because it's SIGTARP, <laughs> I was SIGTARP. Two, you got half my budget. You got 25 million of my 50 million, which in my view is an enormous mistake given the size and scope of these programs and the fact that, you know, I was dealing with a much smaller universe of recipients than they're going to be dealing with here. But third, they included a term of five years. And so for SIGTARP, that office existed as long as troubled assets were outstanding. So that means as long as there was still government money out there, the agency existed. It, it didn't sunset until the last troubled asset was either written off or returned. And because some of these programs, including the housing program, had really, really long tails, the, the agency exists uh, under that legislation. SIGPER, unless they change it, has a hard end date of five years. So there, it's going to be around for five years, of course, unless Congress extends it. Although my guess is there probably won't, one, their work will not be done in five years. I think that is for sure, um, given the nature of, of this relief. But it's also, there's a good chance that the work will be transferred back to Department of Justice. It's cases reassigned to the FBI or others. And the work will continue, if even perhaps if the Special Inspector General does not. Um, but I guess if there's, a, if there's a significant enough volume five years out, um, you could see Congress extending it. But I, I'd probably bet against it. There's a lot of inertia in this. You know, if SIGTARP was something that was coming up for a vote every year, it wouldn't still be around. But it's still doing really important good work. And so there's really no reason for Congress to affirmatively shut it down. So I think that, that's my best guess. Well, I, I hadn't realized the, um, the funding uh, disparity you know, the, the ratio of you know, what's been allocated to a special inspector general this time around compared to, to SIGTARP. Boy, that, that seems disproportionately low given the, the amount of money that's been distributed and will be distributed. Uh, and then the other thing I, I, I guess I missed that has a, a five-year shelf. Yeah, that seems inadequate. But I guess uh, to your point, you know, if they're able to, to justify and their existence and sing for their supper, uh, but you're right, you know, the the political wins are now a factor, you know, five years out, whereas um, uh, for your situation, it was different. I think we touched upon this a little bit, but, you know, so that, you know, the CARES Act has been distributing relief for several months now. What frauds are already happening? And, you know, and, and like what, a, you know, is there anything that we haven't seen yet that is likely to occur? Think, you know, things we haven't discussed already. You know, I think that, I can't think of anything we haven't discussed already. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much covered it. I mean, you're going to see, you know, the big investigations into the big companies. You're going to see the smaller investigations into the PPP recipients, right, which are going to be the, the more of the low-hanging fruit. Um, and I guess we're going to see what additional programs might be launched. Because, um, you know, remember, one thing to remember here is that there's a huge amount of dry powder. You know, the way that the CARES Act work money is, Treasury is making equity investments in Federal Reserve facilities that go out and lend. 
And that's why the $450 billion that the CARES Act allocated to the Treasury Department to work with the Federal Reserve has already been levered up to multiple trillion dollars of commitment. But there's still trillions more if they need to go back to that well, if the economy doesn't recover, programs are not as effective. And so, so part of it is we don't even know yet because if they end up tapping out all of this money, we've literally trillions and trillions of dollars potentially to go. Yeah. Well, and this has been a great discussion, Neil. I really uh, appreciate you sharing these insights. So that's all the time we have today. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, that was Jenner and Block partner and former TARP Inspector General Neil Borofsky, who leads Jenner and Block's COVID-19 response team and counsels clients on how to navigate the crisis and the government's response to the global pandemic. This concludes this episode of Fraud Eat Strategy. I'm Scott Moritz, Senior Managing Director and FTI Consulting's Forensic and Litigation Consulting segment. Thank you for listening and stay tuned for the next episode of Fraud Eat Strategy when we'll hear from noted Chief Compliance Officer and Thought Leader, Carrie Penman from NAVEX Global, together with George Washington University Business School Assistant Professor, Kyle Welch, who will help answer the question, is it possible to measure the return on investment of effective compliance? If you have an idea on a fraud or corruption case, topic, or guest that you'd like to hear about on a future episode, email us at fraudeatstrategy at fticonsulting.com. Thanks for listening.